Welcome to Unapologetically Sensitive, a place to find connection and a sense of belonging, where you can learn, relate, laugh, and maybe even live a bolder, brighter life. I'm your host, Patricia Young. This is a weekly podcast where we talk about sensitivity and the richness that it adds, the strengths we have because of our sensitivity, and some of the challenges it poses as well. The information in this podcast is not a substitute for help from a licensed mental health professional. Hey there. To the creatives, healers, sensitives, and deep thinkers, I think you're really going to enjoy this episode today with Jacqueline Strickland. Back in 2000, she began working exclusively with highly sensitive people, and that same year, she and Dr. Elaine Aaron co-created the National and International HSP Gathering Retreats. I consider her an expert in this field, so I'm really excited. We talk about the DOES, the four core characteristics that Dr. Elaine Aaron came up with to define the traits of being highly sensitive, and she really gives a rich overview of it. And I've been really trying since I started the podcast to get somebody to come and talk about this. So this is a great episode to listen to. If you're curious to know about what does it mean to be a highly sensitive person and what do the traits look like? She also talks in depth about introversion and extroversion for that highly sensitive person and the non highly sensitive person. And then a fifth type that she calls the ambivert. And I think this really adds great clarification. I know that I just did a bonus episode 60 where I did a Facebook live following my interview with Jacqueline, but in this episode, she really goes deep in it. I do want to let you know that when I record remote interviews, we use a, I use a program and sometimes there's some distortion in the recording and, and sometimes the words also get distorted. I've done the best job that I can. I had my editor do this. I went back through it and really tried to clean it up. But I just want to let you know that there is a little bit of wonkiness with the sound. I think this is an amazing episode. I'm really excited to share it with you. There's some great articles that Jacqueline has written that are in the show notes at unapologeticallysensitive.com. I think it's an amazing episode. So let me tell you a little bit about Jacqueline, and then we're going to get onto the episode. Jacqueline has been a licensed professional counselor since 1993, which is the same year she became certified to utilize the statistically valid and reliable Myers-Briggs personality assessment. She has been working exclusively with HSP since 2000, the same year she and Dr. Elaine Aaron co-created the National and International HSP Gathering Retreats. Besides Elaine Aaron, major influences which have informed Jacqueline's work have been her background in social work, women's studies, Brene Brown, eco-psychology, and her nature as teacher and healer experiences. If you want a more detailed bio of Jacqueline, she had so much to offer, it will be in the show notes. If you're enjoying the podcast, you can really help me out by continuing to share it. You're doing a great job. More and more people are listening to the podcast. It's listened to internationally. If you're comfortable rating and reviewing it, it's easy to do it in Apple iTunes. If I remember, I'll put instructions in the show notes about how you can use a laptop to rate and review. And now on to the show. Hey, Jacqueline, welcome. Hi, Patricia. Thank you for having me. I am so excited to have you here today. You have so much knowledge and information that I'm just hungry to get the scoop on and get it out to the listeners. Thanks. My my vast knowledge of information can overwhelm me at times as well, since I think I'm one of the original people to find out about this way back in 1996. All right. Sounds great. So obviously, you identify as a highly sensitive person. What do you think of the term highly sensitive person? Yeah, I've been asked that question so many times. And I know personally that, that Elaine Aaron struggled with that name. And so did her editors and trying to come up with something else. So for me, I fully accepted it. Sometimes I say I have a finely tuned nervous system. So I'm fine with it. I know it can cause confusion, especially to the other people who often remark, well, I'm sensitive too. And then we get into a discussion about what it really means. So I'm fine with it, basically. Sure. That sounds great. I want to jump right into our content. So I'd love to have you talk about the four core characteristics of being a highly sensitive person. 
maybe you can talk about why these are important and then can we go over each one and can you talk a little bit about each, what each one looks like? And on this, since I haven't been able to get anybody to do that yet. Why is the acronym BOES so important for we HSPs? Well, Elaine Aaron um, came up with this acronym. I think it was either while she was writing Psychotherapy in the Highly Sensitive Person or shortly thereafter. And it's important because out of the 1.4 billion HSPs in the world, we all share these four things. And so depth of processing, I've heard Elaine say, and I tend to agree, that depth of processing is really the key thing for we HSPs. Overstimulation is important. Emotional intensity and responsiveness and empathy is important. And sensitive to subtleties is important. But she feels that depth of processing and the more active prefrontal cortex that we have creates this depth of processing to see breadth and depth of of, uh, things around us. And so we HSPs tend to, with our depth of processing, reflect more than others on the way the world is going, the meaning of life, wondering about the quality of the relationship we're in, what may have happened or will happen. We can tend to experience very deep, deep feelings and empathy for others and our depth of processing tends to make us aware of social justice issues, and many of us often work for some cause. So our depth of processing, too, in the way we see the world can often be a catalyst for us to have very vivid dreams and help us to sort of see and sense consequent, long-term consequences of certain events in our life. I love that. Thank you. Mm-hmm. Then I have a question for the O. I've always said over arousal and overstimulation. Is that inaccurate? Oh, you know, I'm a big word person. And to truly accurately answer that question, I would want to look up the word over arousal and compare it to overstimulation. I suspect they're probably very similar. So I wouldn't worry about it too much. Overstimulation is just that sense of feeling stressed out feeling burnt out, overwhelmed. I just was talking with a client the other day and she said, I just hit a wall and I couldn't do anything else despite my left brain that was telling me, but you have so much more to do. Her body was just saying, no, I I have hit a wall. So overstimulation is probably the most negative thing that we HSPs have is that Our current dominant culture can create so much overstimulation in us And so we have to be really, really careful about what filters we let in in our day. Um, I know I have to practice that with depth of processing because my depth of processing almost always leads to overstimulation unless I consciously choose, okay, we got these 12 things that that have come into your life today and they're greatly affecting you and you're thinking about them deeply. Which ones are serving me today? Which ones are serving you in this moment so that I'm more in control of not allowing others to create undue overstimulation? Because as we know, chronic overstimulation leads to too much cortisol in our body, which then can lead to depression and anxiety, which then makes HSPs, the generalization becomes popular that all HSPs are anxious and depressed, which is not true. So... Anyway, that's overstimulation or over arousal, however you want to refer to it. Okay. How about the next one? Yeah, emotional intensity, responsiveness, and empathy to others is we just bring more emotional intensity and empathy to almost every situation. Um, I, there's a difference between emotional intensity and empathy and emotional reactivity. I think that is very key skill to learn for HSPs is to know when to act versus react. Um, I think our emotional intensity uh, can really help us tune into the arts 
and can really help us express our feelings. I think that's why when we can honor our emotional intensity, empathy, that's why we can write beautiful poems after seeing a sunset. That's why we have poets and photographers and and authors and speakers and historians who can take how passionately they feel about something and turn it into a work of art. Our emotional intensity can also easily move us to tears or to a sense of joy or gratitude and other wonderful things. And we have more mirror neurons, so that's where this comes into play. Is that correct? Yes, yes, we do. So that's where this emotional empathy, because of our emotional neurons, we can easily pick up more on a mood from a loved one coming in the door who's had a rough day or or just pick up on different energies that we may or may not want to pick up on. And again, I think that we can be in charge of that. I don't think we have to be victim to picking up on all the emotions of other and moods of other people. There are ways to uh, protect ourselves from those that we don't want to influence our day. Sensitive to subtleties. Subtleties meaning that we are usually sensitive to possibly changes in temperature, finding it uncomfortable to be too hot or too cold. Uh, We tend to notice when the barometric pressure is dropping. Uh, Some of our senses may be keener, such as some HSPs may have a perfect pitch. We have more side effects of medications. As children, sensory sensitivity may have shown up in Things such as not liking tags or having their hair combed or tight clothing, shoes not fitting right. We can also notice sensitive to subtleties in that just noticing that someone got a haircut or someone got a new dress or someone is feeling happier today than they were yesterday. Sensitive to subtleties is also um, the sound of a ticking clock or dripping water as we're trying to go to bed. So some people say, yeah, sensitive subtleties were so sensitive to noise and light and, and those kinds of sensory stimuli. And that's true. However, the same HSP who can be sensitive to a ticking clock or dripping water in a bedroom, in a bathroom far away where you're trying to go to sleep, that same HSP might relish turning up their music really loud and dancing and and ecstatically experiencing music or a concert which has lights going on. So again, it's this sensitivity to light is uh, light and sound is so personal. My own sensitivity light, you know, I have to have sunglasses on, so I just have to. Uh, Sound, I love turning my music up so loud. Ticking clock drives me crazy. So we're all different. Yep. I, I joke. I think I was a mole in a previous light be, life because I always have to have sunglasses on if I'm outside. I noticed too that depending on the context of what's going on in my life, like I was traveling last week and a friend took me out to dinner and the restaurant was very noisy and they had live music that was not really something that I enjoyed. While it kind of grated on my nervous system, because I was out with a friend and it was a novel situation, I was kind of able to compartmentalize and just sort of tune it out. If you would ask me, is this a venue you'd want to go into? It's like, well, no. And there are times when I'm able to just kind of tune things out and manage. And then I knew when I got back home, I needed more time for downtime. I had a slower start the next day. So I do find that there are times when I can manage things that I wouldn't normally choose if there's a reason to do that. Absolutely. And I think I would be the same with you in that same situation where a band was playing and the music was particularly grating on me or just had some effect on me that was not pleasing. But I can think of a few times we were in vacation um, with a dear friend in Barbados and we were at this place having dinner. It was on the beach and there was this band playing. It was so loud. And, you know, The next thing I know, I'm up dancing on the sand and just really getting into this music and just, you know, the sound did not bother me at all. Yeah. And I think it's really important for us to notice when we are able to be in environments or push ourselves in a way, and I don't mean in a way that violates our boundaries, but when we do experience things that are outside the range of what we would consider our preferences, that we really make a note of that. Because I think that our capacity for things is much greater, but because we get so over aroused and overstimulated in some situations, we're really reluctant to put ourselves back in those situations. 
And sometimes our capacity to endure things is much bigger and we get to experience a little bit more life. I want to be really clear. I'm not talking about doing anything that's going to intentionally overstimulate you or over get you over aroused. But I, I think often we can do more than we think that we can. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I think a great example of that is the HSP gathering retreats when I hear people say, oh, I could never be with 25 or 30 HSPs for four days. But yet I see people uh, coming and finding it one of the most extraordinary experiences they've had. And we have music, we have poetry, we have laughter, we have tears, we have, you know, a ton of stimulation, but it's a good kind of stimulation. And I often joke about, yep, you're going to be overstimulated these four days, but you know, it's the good kind. So take care of yourself. Right, right. Which leads us into our next topic, which I'm so excited to hear you talk about because I hear so much talk about introversion and extroversion. And most HSPs that I run into think that they're introverts. I mean, you know, we know that 70% of HSPs are introverts and 30% are extroverts, but it looks so different if you're an HSP. So I can't wait to hear you talk about this. Okay. Well, there's so much to say about that. And, um, and I'm not going to talk too much about it because I did a, an inter- I interview with 37 sensitive extroverts and it was published as a guest blog on the Lane Aaron's website, which I think you've shared many times. But basically, when we're talking about introvert and extrovert and highly sensitive people, I, I think we have to talk about five distinct temperaments. We have to talk about the HSP introvert, the HSP extrovert, the introvert in general, and then the extrovert in general. And the new term that's been thrown about is the ambivert. I've met very few people who I would truly say are true ambiverts. And then let's go back to the HSP and introvert and extrovert. We have more similarities together simply because whether introvert or extrovert as a sensitive person, we all share all four of the DOES. My introverted non-HSP husband has a great deal of depth of processing, but I've only seen him overstimulated once when he had knee surgery and he overdid it in physical therapy. The extrovert, non-HSP extrovert, they might have emotional intensity. We can see it all the time. They're passionate. They can get up on stage and be passionate about things, but they do not have all four. So again, it's just the all four added to the 27 self-assessment question that Elaine Aaron created. If you can identify with all four of the DOAS and answer a majority of those 27 questions, that is differentiating you from other introverts. My introverted non-HS husband doesn't answer very many of the questions on the assessment at all. So again, we just can't lump us all together. So can you give us some specifics? Uh, What I would love is for the listeners to go like, okay, I identify with that, 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 that. Okay, I think I'm an HSP introvert. Oh, especially the HSP extrovert. Because I thought I was an introvert because so much of what's been written about includes the traits of an HSP and it hasn't been teased out. So I would love to make this really clear. Is it easier if I ask you some questions? What's the best way to do this? Yeah, go ahead and ask me some of your personal questions. I, I've kind of I've kind of smiled when I see you, Patricia, often say, well, I'm an, I, I've tested an INFJ, but I'm actually an extrovert. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> well, because everything that I read about being an extrovert, I, I don't like, you know, being around a lot of people. I don't like loud venues. I don't get really energized by being out and about a lot, but I love connecting. I love having in-depth conversations. I'm definitely a verbal processor. I, I respond very quickly to things. I love that novelty. I love that stimulation. I really thought that I was an introvert. So yeah. So a lot of the things that I read, uh, well, let's look at the battery charging. All the memes that we see about if you're an extrovert, you get your batteries charged by being around people. And if you're an introvert, you get your battery charged by being alone. Can you address that? Yeah, that's a great way to do it. And that's Carl Jung's definitions uh, from his book, Psychological Types. And it's from, it's where the Myers-Briggs was derived from. Now this Myers-Briggs was created way before any information on the HSP trait came along. So let's look at introversion and extroversion. 
um, when I do my HSP Myers-Briggs Overlay class, I ask the participants, so what are the stereotypes for extroverts? And it's gregarious, bold, outgoing, involved in a million different things, on different committees, et cetera. And what's the definition of an introvert? Well, tend to be shy, withdrawn, quiet, only like to be with one or two other people. And so gets their energy renewed by being alone. I would say definitely it just introverts get their energy renewed by being alone, by keeping their thoughts and feelings inside until they're fully ready to be formed. And then I think the HSP extrovert also gets their energy renewed by being alone. In fact, we must go inward because of overstimulation, because the external world can overwhelm us. So we must go in to recharge mostly for me physically, but it's also where I process my day. It's where my spiritual life lives. It's where I go into prayer and deep meditation and deep intuition. I don't do that publicly. I may share some of the results of that with one or two other people, but you're not going to see me out there broadcasting that. So I could look like an introvert. Many people who don't know me well I think I'm an introvert because I spend a great deal of time alone. My office is in my home. It can be Wednesday and I'll start feeling kind of lethargic, kind of low mood, kind of unenthused. And it'll dawn me, wow, you haven't been out of the house or had a deep conversation with anybody truly since Saturday. So it's kind of like, oh, if I don't get out and create a novel experience for myself, that mood will kind of continue to take me down. So an HSP extrovert needs to find novel stimulation to renew and recharge ourselves. Uh, we can do that with a friend, another friend, like your, your breakfast this morning with your friends um, you mentioned was so energizing. But we HSP experts can't go out into the world with just any old plan. Like when my husband used to, at my husband's work, we used to have to go to these functions and so the extrovert, normal extrovert would be like, great, we're going to this function. We're going to get a, you know, a fine meal and blah, blah, blah. And I'd be like, oh, God, we have to go. I don't want to go. I don't know these people. I won't ever meet these people again. It was always draining for me. So does that help a little? It does. And, and what I'm wondering is, because I've always noticed, like, if there's an event, I don't want to know what we're doing. I want to know who's going to be there. And I hadn't really ever related that to my trait of being an HSP because I want to know that I can connect with somebody. And so I just had an aha moment. Like, I think that's a defining characteristic. What do you think? Absolutely. I want to know <laughs> who's going to be there, what's their political affiliation, what we're going to be doing, how long we're going to be there. Because I, like you, don't want to go and engage in surface talk with people that I may or may not ever want to see again. I'm very choosy about, especially the older I get, I'm becoming more introverted, not because I am an introvert, but because I'm a sensitive extrovert who's very discerning about my energy, where I put it out, what I receive in, and it serves me in, in that way. Yeah. And I, I find one of the things that's interesting this morning, I was telling my husband because I had to get together. I was, I did an online summit. And so the organizer has found some other HSPs. And so he did a little breakfast meetup this morning. And I was telling my husband, like, there's definitely a part of me that when I'm out and connected, I feel so like I have a lot to offer and I have great social skills. And when I'm at home, I feel like I really don't have a lot to offer. And it's hard for me to get moving like that thing about transitions is difficult. And so it feels sometimes really confusing to me because that transition of just get dressed and go. Once I'm there, I have a great time, but that making the move from here to there can be really challenging. And I thought I had social anxiety. I labeled myself as having anxiety and depression. I thought I was an introvert. Learning about the traits of being a highly sensitive person and understanding it has allowed me so much room to show up in the world in such a different way. And I, I think that we get overstimulated in environments when we're young and it just feels yucky and we don't want to go back into it, but we don't understand what it was about the situation. And so we just don't want that level of being over aroused again. Yeah. And I think that's, you know, a perfect 
example of an experience when, for when many of us were unempowered as highly sensitive people. We didn't know to make that we had the right to discern which events we wanted to say yes to and no to. And, uh, and now we do, and that's wonderful. And, and like you, oftentimes at home, I'm married to a major introvert, non-HSP, who is a wonderful person, but his energy and my energy can often clash. And so I have to be really careful of being aware of that and, and getting out into the world because I can't put too much pressure and too much expectation on him to elevate my mood, to be who he's not and vice versa. So I have to be really careful about planning to get out of the house uh, in novel ways. I have, I'm fortunate to have several women friends who serve a great purpose for me of friendship, depth of processing, honoring my HSP trait. Yeah, exactly. So I'm, I'm still wanting to get some really specific examples about extroverts. So I'm going to read you a couple of statements. And can you tell me if you think it's an HSP thing, an introvert or extrovert? We're going to, we're going to make up a new game show here. Are you, do you want to play? Uh, okay. <laughs> I'm not very good at games, but I'll give it. <laughs> so I act differently around different people, and it's not because I'm fake. It's because I have a different comfort zone around certain people. True, as do I. Okay, and so would you be able to say that's introvert or extrovert, or is that just HSP? I say that as an empowered HSP who is aware of her environment, the energies there, the different values of the people there, and what's safe. How, how safe you feel to fully express who you really are and what you really think and feel. And so, I mean, there are many times when I'm in an environment where I am acting totally introvert. And I like to, by the way, I like to look at introversion and extroversion as verbs. So mm -hmm. when I'm very aware when I am in environments and I am choosing to, to be very, very introverted and just be an observer, those don't generally energize me at all, but it's a, it's an act of self-protection. Yeah. If I feel like I have to fight to be heard or seen, that will totally pull out my introvert. That, that, that just is, it's so against how I like to show up in the world, unless it's something that I have a meaning and a purpose and I'm advocating, but that's something that will make me look totally like an introvert because that's just not how I show up. Right. Right. You can be a sensitive extrovert. And you can choose to introvert, just like Elaine Aaron is a major introvert. And over the years of knowing her and working with her at the gatherings, I've seen her actually blossom. And she is very capable of extroverting. In fact, she tells me how much she enjoys, enjoys it when she's there extroverting. But normally, it doesn't come easy to her. Right. And I think that there's this belief that if you're an extrovert, you're always comfortable socially, you don't feel awkward, you don't have doubts, you don't think about conversations and things that you said after the fact. And I, that's not my experience. There are times when I still feel very awkward, very uncomfortable. I have a conversation, I go home and I think about what I said. And I think that people attribute that to being an introvert. And I think that's the characteristic of being a highly sensitive person. What do you think? Yeah, I think that... Um, the person who doesn't really, I mean, let's just generalize to the general extrovert. I know a few in my life, my husband's friends with one, and he, I'm sure he, he just talks and carries on and has a great time. And I, I, I would doubt seriously if he ever went home thinking, gosh, did I talk too much? Did I cut her off? Did I? Whereas I'm always, not always, but many times thinking that. And so I think it's a sensitive extrovert's tendency to have depth of processing and great deal of empathy in that, you know, we I do it all the time at the HSP gatherings by going to people say to me, God, you're so strong. How can you do this between, uh, you know, year after year among all these people and wow, you, you know, they just sort of put me on this inaccurate pedestal of how strong I am. They don't see me going to my room break and taking deep breaths and going, oh, should I have said that? Was that, was that too you know, how could I reframe that? Do I need to go back and explain that? You know, I work, I have this whole process that I can work through this kind of thing in about 15 minutes and come to some kind of peace with it. But yeah, I do it too. And I just think it's our depth of processing and our 
ability to pick up on subtleties. I noticed that person over on the far right, her face looked confused. I wonder if she's angry. I mean, yeah, all that. So I go inward to do that. I go inward and I introvert to process that. But I'm still a sensitive extrovert. Yeah, I find too that if I have a social event, like if I have a role to play, I'm going to hand out drinks. I'm going to give people name tags. It takes me out of myself and that part of me that feels like I'm anxious and I'm awkward and I'm not comfortable. But if you give me a task, that part of me that really responds well to responsibility and to duty, all of a sudden it pulls on a very different part of me. But I I think that when we have this expectation that we're supposed to show up like the non sensitive extroverts, for me, I feel like I'm going to miss the mark so much that it pulls on the part of me that's more introverted as opposed to who I am and how I show up is okay, but I need to find a way to either get a role or to lower the bar. Does that make sense? Oh, it makes great sense. And I think it's a a wise self-care practice, Patricia. I think there's nothing wrong with that. And it's not pathological at all. It's just, I think it's very healthy. And if the same happens at the gatherings, I can't tell you how many introverts come up and they volunteer and they want to help me do this. And they want to help me. They want to pass out the name tags and they want to put the flip charts up and they want to organize the leisure time. And yeah, because they feel comfortable and they're coming out, they're extroverting. (laughs) So what they're doing, even though they're introverts. Right. It's interesting. I just recorded a guest episode on somebody else's podcast about the highly sensitive person and it's for clinicians to get CEUs. I found myself really nervous and anxious the night before and the day that we were recording. I talk about this stuff all the time. I've been on at least 10 other podcasts where I talk about the highly sensitive person, but with that overlay of like, this is serious, it's for CEUs, it brought up the part of me that feels like I have to follow the rules, and what if I ramble, and what if I'm too personal, and I found it really constricting me, and I know that if my nerves get the best of me, you're not going to get a very cohesive piece of information out of me, and the way that I dealt with it is I talked to the host before we started recording, I really didn't expect to process it as part of the interview, but I started out by saying, I'm feeling really nervous, my heart is pounding, and this is what I'm feeling concerned about. Just creating room for that helped me to relax and remind myself, like, I know my stuff, but I think that when there's that overlay of social expectations, rules, norms, because we want to get it right, it can really inhibit us. And, I, and I'm wondering if that's another part where people that may be highly sensitive extroverts feel like they're introverts because that part takes over. What do you think? I think that's a healthy thing to be aware of for all HSP sensitive or sensitive extroverts or sensitive introverts, because I find I often am aware of having one foot in the dominant culture and one foot in my authentic way. In fact, I love the artist way by Julia Cameron. I've read it so Mm -hmm. many times. I've done it so many times and I've changed. I inevitably changed the artist way to the HSP way. So to me, there is an HSP way an authentic way of me being in the world of which has become thankfully and gratefully for me, my dominant way of being in the world. It's my non, it's, it's not the other 80%. So I, I don't tend to put a lot of emphasis on rules and norms and expectations that the other 80% value because I don't really value them. And I'm not discrediting them. They work for them. That's wonderful. It works for you. But what works better for me is this. And and so I've just grown to have trust in living my life professionally and personally in my own authentic way. And my own authentic way is probably different than yours and different than everyone else who's listening to this. We have to develop our own HSP way of being in the world and be aware of dominant culture and what they say is right and wrong and da da da. Yeah. I, I realized when you were talking that I have an agenda. So I'm just I'm just gonna be really transparent about my agenda. Okay. Because I thought I had social anxiety, because I thought I was an introvert, I use that as a way to not participate in the world. And it really created some what what I labeled as depression. I can see now it wasn't depression. And so I think that my hidden agenda and if you're an introvert and I'm not acknowledging you or talking about you, I please, please forgive me, extend me some grace. 
But I think what my agenda is for those people that may be highly sensitive extroverts and identify with the thought of being an introvert and use that as a reason to not participate, where there may be so much more fullness in life. And what I'm finding is I've, you know, went to a conference last week and I'm just doing so many more things that once I learned I was an extrovert, it really shifted what I told myself. And I feel like my world has really opened up and expanded. And so I'm imagining other highly sensitive extroverts that think that they're introverts or think they have social anxiety, and it may not be that. I'm just like, I just want to show you that there's another way that you can experience the world. And so if it feels like I have an agenda, I just realized I do. And that's what it is. Yeah. And I think it's role modeling that, you know, when we have unhelpful, inaccurate beliefs about ourselves, it causes us to want to hide from the world. And as opposed to when we are fully self-identified and integrated as an HSP, whether it be an extrovert or or a sensitive extrovert, when we fully know, I think, our Myers-Briggs type and all the ramifications of what that means, not just oh, I took that on this online sign and I was a INTFJP. Well, you know, you haven't integrated fully. You haven't gotten the full depth of what Myers-Briggs has to offer. So self-identity is huge. I use that and the Enneagram. So once we get fully integrated with a strong sense of self-identity, when we've healed our wounds, when we've reframed our past, uh, when we've got a plan of knowing when and how to be out in the world, it becomes a choice of when we go out. We we don't hide anymore. We distinguish resting and taking care and being alone from hiding. And we rest for the purpose of going back out into the world as who we truly are in a novel way that we've chosen and give our gifts to the world. And I don't expect to give my gifts to the world and my authentic self to the whole world. I just give it in special places, novel places that I've been blessed to be invited to, involved with, that I've created myself. But I don't, unlike when I was younger, (laughs) unempowered, thinking I could change the world and all the unjust injustices in the world. And I would show up on my soapbox trying to convince people that things needed to change. Well, that wasn't very wise of me. So I've learned to be very particular and discerning about where, where and how I share my gifts. Yeah, I think that's really important for us. Something you said earlier has made me curious, because I took the Myers-Briggs, I was actually thinking it was probably 12, 12 years ago. So it's been quite some time. And I came out as an INFJ. And you made a comment earlier that when you see me post in groups that I'm an INFJ, if I were to take it today, do you have a sense of how you think that would show up? Yeah, because there's so many variables that can affect the results of the statistically valid and reliable Myers-Briggs assessment. And so if you took it 12 years ago, you know, I'm not sure what was going on with you then, but that's where the benefit of doing the statistically valid and reliable assessment and where I, as the professional consultant gets your raw scores. We can, generally speaking, a sensitive extrovert will have a really low score between introversion and extroversion. So many people say, oh gosh, I am just, that's why I'm an ambivert, is because I have a low score between introvert and extrovert. And I can expert and I can, no, it, what Myers Briggs says is a low score between introversion and extroversion implies some sort of transition or turmoil between those two preferences. So it's perfect for the sensitive expert. We go out as an extrovert. If we're not careful, we get way overstimulated chronically if we're in the wrong environment. We come back in. If we're unempowered, we hide. We go over, why did we say that? Why did da 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 And so we think we're an introvert. And then we get too unmotivated and uninspired by being in too long. So then we go out again and the same thing happens. So it's in, out, in, out. (laughs) Don't like being in, out. Don't like being in. So that's why that's the transition in the turmoil until you figure it out, until you go, yeah, I'm going out as a sensitive extrovert. I can't wait to experience this and this because I'm creating it. 
So I would suspect um, that if you took it again, and I would love us to do that, just I think you would learn so much because I, I laugh when you say I'm a I'm a sensitive extrovert, but I'm really a, but I test INFJ. Well, there's reasons for that, and I and we could explain that. So I suspect that you might probably be an ENFJ with a very, very well developed introverted side, which serves you because of overstimulation, just like I'm an ENFP with the very well introverted side that I use in service to what I'm doing in the world. If I didn't go inward and recharge and pray and meditate and, and express myself through art and music inwardly, when I go out to a gathering, I would just be a nervous wreck. Yeah. And it's one of those things where labels can either be really helpful or they can be harmful and it can go one way or the other. And the few statements that I read to you, were from uh, something that's under under the label of introversion. So I think that's where a lot of the confusion comes from that I would read things about introversion that really were about high sensitivity and I identified. And so I just kind of, every, all my thinking went, I must be an introvert, which is why I'm just so passionate about providing education so that people just can make choices that work for them. And it's that fine line of how labels can really expand or kind of limit us exactly especially if you don't understand them fully and unfortunately there's been so many books and articles and uh, you may be an introvert if you do this and that and it's it's just gotten too many generalizations too many stereotypes so it's it's very confusing and I will put in the show notes at unapologetically sensitive.com I'm Jacqueline has some resources that she'll tell us about and I'm going to link again to your article which I probably post at least once a week introversion, extroversion, and the highly sensitive person, which is excellent. So the last thing we haven't talked about is ambivert. Can you explain what an ambivert is? Well, that's kind of a new term. And that's, um, I'm not sure that I fully agree with that. But I'm not going to argue with anyone who wants to identify as an ambivert. But it gets back to that, you know, what's your score between what's your raw score between introversion and extroversion? Confusion happens when they say, oh, I'm really right in between, so I must be well-balanced between introversion and extroversion, so therefore I'm an ambivert. That's one point of conversation that goes on out there. I say that's the sensitive expert, but I I do think I've met one. I know a a friend who often challenges me about this whole HSP thing, and she wants to believe it, but she's... She just wants to challenge me. She's like, well, you know, I have depth of processing too. Look at my bookshelves, look at all the books I read. I go deep into all these subjects. So why aren't I an HSP? And and, and she goes, and then I get overstimulated. Like I can just go out for a short while and 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 I want to come home and take a rest. Well, once she's in her late 70s. So that's why she gets overstimulated. But she's not sensitive to subtleties. She's not sensitive to noise we were on public transportation in san francisco and some some brakes started screech screeching and i just immediately had to cover my ears and she just kept on talking like it didn't even bother her and so i think she might be a true amber bird she likes to go out and she does go out she gets on public transportation screeching doesn't bother her crowds don't bother her uh she goes back in, and she does enjoy, she lives alone. She's in her 70s. She reads voraciously. She does enjoy being alone. So I think she might be a true ambivert, but she doesn't have DOES. So with an ambivert, I actually am gleaning this from your article, which I was looking at yesterday for another purpose, that an ambivert can consciously choose whether they want to extrovert or introvert. Is, is that correct? I think HSVs can consciously choose whether they want to introvert or extrovert. So what's the distinction with the ambivert then? Well, the ambivert doesn't have all four of the DOES. Okay. So whether you're an HSP or not, we can choose whether we want to extrovert or introvert. But the distinction is whether you've got the DOES, which is I know what you've been saying. I'm just recapping. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Got it. I'm ready to move on. Are you? Yes. Does sensitivity increase as we age? Well, personally speaking, for me, it most definitely does. Um, I've heard Elaine Aaron say the same thing. I don't think there's necessarily any science or research behind it. But for me, it's a, just, it's a logical uh, thing. Our eyesight deteriorates, our muscles deteriorate. Our Why would our nervous system not also age and become more 
sensitive. Why is it important for highly sensitive people to be around other highly sensitive people? We're transitioning. That was a very abrupt transition. Well, (laughs) it is very important because I wrote an article on that. I hope you put it in the notes. It's 10 reasons why HSPs need to be in relationship with another HSP. This came to me with a dear extroverted friend after we had just spent three days backpacking in the Colorado wilderness. And we were both left in such a state of awe and wonder and full self-expression and expansion. And we were like, ah, what just happened with us? And we came up with these 10 ways that, that I think serve HSPs when they're in connection and in reciprocal relationships with other HSPs. And I won't go into all of them because you're going to post it on the notes, but basically we fully come out and be our authentic self, a sense of feeling seen and heard and accepted encourages us to focus on our strengths. It opens our, softens our heart from the HSP gathering perspective, why it's important. What I see happening with HSPs, for the most part, they come in on day one and there's just this incredible silence and this pause to check and people have shared that they felt doubtful about being there insecure they, they've come because they're lonely they feel fragile they feel vulnerable and you know after two or three days and they usually leave feeling much more inspired courageous they have a great deal of self-compassion and acceptance for themselves because they see 25 or 30 other people fully living their lives and they start to trust their needs So it's just so important to be with another HSP. And and, and I'm going to go out on a limb here a little bit. And I think being with an HSP for me doesn't include social media. I know social media has been incredibly supportive and helpful for, for thousands of HSPs around the world. But there is something about spending time and having one other person in your life who's an HSP that you can process things with. Yeah. And with the HSP retreats that you run, what have you noticed after participants have been around other HSPs? Well, I've noticed that they have moved from feeling uncertain and doubtful to getting a lot more courageous, so courageous that many of them perform on our creativity night, which is an opportunity. It's kind of like a talent show. And I've seen HSPs perform, dance, poetry, monologues, share their photography. I've seen them become fully engaged, fully extroverting, and manifesting their gifts, as opposed to sitting back and being Uh, just an observer. It's just sort of a place that creates a lot of authentic energy and joy and happiness and just a lot of the higher vibrations. I love that. What is, do do highly sensitive people experience more inhibition than non-highly sensitive people? Well, you know, I think that's a good question. And we have, I'm, I'm not going to be good at explaining it right now, but in one of Elaine's books, she talks about we have these two systems, an inhibition system, which causes us to pause and check, and another part of that system, which creates curiosity and wanting to know more about the world. So I think it's uh, both and. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I find that in certain areas, I'm, you know, when it comes to communication and being vulnerable, I'm a high sensation seeker. Seeker, I'm out there, I'm taking risks. But when it comes to things in my body or improv or dancing, like, I just feel really inhibited. And so it's just very interesting to see how that shows up. And I, I mean, I'm sure it's a very complicated question, but and it makes sense. So yeah. Well, you know, I think let's let's talk about a ver- just briefly about how HSP show up in the world. I have I and some of my colleagues have been very concerned about all the generalizations about HSPs. The generalizations have become so vast and so broad. Sometimes I don't recognize myself. Can you share what a couple of those are, just so we know what we're talking about? Oh, you know, you see things like, does anyone else 
have trouble going to the grocery store and people are standing too close to you. And, you know, 30 people go, oh, yes, me, me too. I can't stand it when someone is, you know, touching me or passes by me in the store or do, does anyone else sensitive to? I've heard driving, like I have to learn how to drive. Is that hard for you as an HSP? Is that like one of them? Yeah, something like that. Or I can't eat these foods. I can't eat nightshades. Just what about you? And several HSPs go, oh yeah, I can't eat nightshades either because they do this and this and this. So, you know, there's just so many out there because there's so much on social media and I'm not putting down those people who want to collaborate and, and learn from other people and find a like-minded soul who also can't eat night shades. That's fine. But I just want to make a point of in the center of the DLES in the science, there are so many variables which influence the way in which we show up in the world, in which the way our gifts are manifested, things like mental health issues, family of origin, introversion, extroversion, socioeconomic status of your current status, of your family status, of the people, the neighborhoods you grew up in, of the relatives that, who are the five people in your life that see you the most? Is that a positive reflection or is an accurate one or is it disparaging? So there's so many variables the way we show up. And that's why I am so passionate about the science because the science of the DLES is like it allows everyone to relate in their own unique way. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you for that. I'm looking at time and we kind of need to wrap up. Are there any, is there anything specific about being an HSP that I didn't ask you about that you wanted to talk about? Well, I think it would just be, I would just want to give a great deal of gratitude and acknowledgement to Elaine Aaron for creating this work, I know it's not original work. I mean, for her, it's original. Her science is original. But the trade has been around for a long time. She just put it in words and in research that um, has gotten a great deal, as we know, of attention. And she's created an industry of which many people are working and finding meaning in. And many people don't even mention her work. So I just want to be extremely grateful to her and acknowledge her decades of commitment to getting the word out on this wonderful trait. I second that. I, I think so many of us now that specialize in working with highly sensitive people, it's because of Dr. Elaine Aaron's work and we're helping to, sh to spread her message and her work out to heal more people or to provide education to people. So I second that. And, and it's fine to expand on the work. I mean, many researchers, uh, post Dalsky and us we're all expanding on the work and that's fine but um expansion is one thing and remembering where it came from is another so yep thank you dr elaine aaron we really appreciate everything you did to set this up for us yay jacqueline why don't you tell us a little bit about projects that you're working on things that you're offering where people can find you and again i'll put all that in the show notes at unapologetically sensitive.com okay well that's a good complicated question as is not surprisingly, I'm kind of going through a transition. I'm slowly closing out my psychotherapy practice and I do some coaching and mentoring. I've added the word sage to my title and I am still doing the HSP gathering retreats. I'm still doing some online classes, my Myers-Briggs HSP overlay. I want to start doing the Enneagram for HSPs and unintegrated wholeness of the heart way to get out of ruminating. We do that at a lot of the HSP gatherings and you might be seeing HSP gatherings offered in different countries by different professionals that I will be training. So that's something in the works for the future because I am celebrating my 70th birthday in October and I'm finding life is calling me in so many different directions. So it's hard to know where or what I might be doing. <laughs> Congratulations. Is there a website where people can find you at? Yes, it's lifeworkshelp.com. And uh, that's going to be changing soon, but hopefully for now that will work. Okay. Anything else? I think that's it, Patricia. Well, thank you so much for being here today. I've, I've, I asked you to be a guest quite a while ago. This is not to guilt you. This is to say I'm so grateful 
that it worked for us to connect and that you were able to share your wisdom and experience because you really have so much to offer that I'm just thrilled to have a chance to talk with you today. So thank you very much. Yes, you're welcome, Patricia. And um, congratulations on your podcast. It's doing really well and offering so much. Uh, well, thank you. All right. Have a great day, Jacqueline. Thank you. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you so much for being here today. I hope you got a lot out of this episode. I'm Again, I'm so incredibly grateful to Jacqueline for being willing to come on and share her expertise. And again, a big thank you to Dr. Elaine Aaron. A couple of announcements. If you're listening to this when it comes out on the 22nd of October, 2019, and if you are a mental health professional who needs to get CEUs for your license, I just recorded an episode on clearly clinical about the traits of the HSP. And we're doing a giveaway that's going to run until Friday of the week that you hear this episode. You can go to my Instagram account at unapologetically sensitive. I'm going to be promoting on Facebook, but if you're personal friends with me on Facebook, I'll have something posted there and probably on the page unapologetically sensitive. We're going to be doing a giveaway for some free CEUs through Clearly Clinical. If you're interested in working with me, I do online work with people all over the world. It's amazing to be able to have this connection from the comfort of your own home, from work, wherever you're at, where you have some privacy. I am making some amazing connections with people, and I've come up with a coaching model that I found really helpful with highly sensitive people. So you can find out more information at unapologeticallysensitive.com. If you have any questions or anything you want to tell me, you can reach out to me at unapologetically sensitive at gmail.com. Remember, sensitivity is nothing to apologize for. It's our superpower. Have a blessed day. Mm-hmm.